Comparing yourself to other artists can make you feel like crap, but there is a way to harness those feelings and make them work for you. We're going to dive into that on today's episode of Music Therapy. Hey everybody, welcome to Music Therapy. I'm Jessica Risker. I'm a musician based here in Chicago, Illinois, and I am also a licensed clinical professional counselor. Music Therapy is a mental health, existential, creative process podcast, especially for musicians and for music fans. Visit musictherapypodcast.com for previous episodes and upcoming events. Give us a review on Apple Podcasts. And we've also got a Patreon, backslash Music Therapy Podcast. We've got some bonus content over there. So head on over if you want a little extra of the Music Therapy Podcast and want to support the show. Okay, so let's get to today's episode. So, okay, recently we put out an episode called Artistic Jealousy, and that featured therapist Ben Stover, who is also the host of another podcast called Popcorn Psychology, which you should check out. So in that episode, Ben and I discussed comparing ourselves to other musicians, which feels almost unavoidable in this era of the internet and social media. And comparison gives rise to a bunch of feelings. I I chose the word jealousy to put in the title. Maybe that was too strong a word, but I think it's kind of accurate. Jealousy, envy, insecurity, maybe even resentment. It's just kind of a, a cluster of words here for something that can feel really bad. A lot of musicians feel this way, and I know that because they've talked about it on this podcast. So today I wanted to dive even deeper into this. These are really uncomfortable feelings and they can be difficult to resolve. But if these feelings are honored and understood, there is a way that these feelings can actually be helpful. They're telling you something and they can help guide you towards what you want. Today's conversation is all about learning how to do that. Rachel Jones is a licensed marriage and family therapist. She practices in Chicagoland and works with individuals, couples, and families. If you're interested in working with Rachel, I will have a link to her website on the uh, the session notes part of the website, musictherapypodcast.com. Before I share the conversation, I just want to mention that uh, there are times where my sound quality isn't 100%. I'm going to blame Zoom. Zoom does a weird compression thing. I think I've figured it out since then, but when we recorded this, it was still a little off. You may or may not be hearing my child screaming in the background. I guess I'll leave that in because I think it's kind of funny. Um, But overall, it's not that bad. I just wanted to mention it. Okay, let's do it. Here's my conversation with Rachel Jones. Okay, I'm here with Rachel Jones. Rachel, thank you so much for being here today. Absolutely. Happy to be here. So we met, I'm going to explain this a little bit for the listeners. So on Facebook, there is a Chicago Clinical Therapist Networking Group, which is a big group. Uh, Rachel just mouthed that she loves it. What do you love about this group? I, it is the, one of my really big concerns, like going out on my own was like, what if I don't have scope, right? Because when I was in group practices, if I don't have it, someone else has it, right? And so it referrals were really quick. I didn't feel like anybody was in the lurch you know, going on on your own, it's like, okay, I know there's other therapists, but like, how do I find them? Right. Like, how do I have actual, like people who I can get some context on to, to send to people, right. Not just like a cold Google. And I love that. And it's also been really good for my business. I've gotten a substantial amount of referrals from that group. So I, it is the, one of the few things that I think that works beautifully on Facebook. (laughs) I agree. I go on there for, I had some insurance question the other day and, and yeah. And so we connected because, um, I had put up a question on the periodically I do interviews with a therapist for the podcast on, you know, I've done seasonal affective disorder. I've done social anxiety, that kind of thing. And so I went on and said, would anybody be interested in speaking to, um, the topic of, artistic jealousy and, and you were somebody who responded. And I'm curious what, what drew you to this topic? Um, I think a couple pieces, like I, I am, um, I, all the people in my life are in some way, like very creative in differing degrees. Some are musicians. My husband's a writer. Um, I, I have like a lot of creative people in my life. And so I think that 
I'm just kind of fascinated by all of the human stuff that goes on around art um, because it's so impactful on people's lives and like their personhood. And so I think that kind of how that impacts people is really interesting. When you say, I don't mean, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I wanted to ask you further about what you mean by the human stuff that goes into art. What are you referring to? I think that there's, um, I think that art sometimes is kind of talked about in this sort of like one dimensional kind of way. Like it should just be something that like brings things in, right. It's just joyful or it's just creative or it's just, um, a positive thing. And I think that for a lot of people, there's like two sides to that where there can be so much good stuff that it brings in. But I think you also have to confront a lot of yourself sometimes when you're, um, when you're really, really involved with your art. And I, I think that there's this kind of like bi-directional thing with art and the people who create it. Um, and I think that that's really fascinating. Um, that is fascinating. I want to, I actually wanted to hear you talk more about that. For sure. I will. Um, my mom actually told me to make sure I breathed, um, when I was doing the podcast today, cause I get really excited. So, <laughs> um, I just, I think, um, you know, from a personal perspective and from a professional perspective, I've seen art be really healing for people. And I've also seen it be a source of very real frustration and disappointment and difficulty and then you have sort of like this business piece, right? That comes in with art, if that's something that you're pursuing in a professional context. And that is brutal. That's a brutal kind of force that that often impacts people. And so I think this thing that can produce really good feelings and really a lot of um, quality of life for people can... Um, kind of also bring in these difficult elements. And I think that when we talk about art, we talk about it so kind of like one dimensionally a lot of the time that people aren't prepared to deal with those difficult pieces. And it can really tarnish the benefit of, of art for people and make something that was so um, like joyful for them way less joyful. And that sucks because art is super joyful and it's wonderful. And it's one of the best things in the world. And some of these outside pieces can really dampen that for people. And it, it sucks. I I really love this, the way that you're talking about this. I mean, I know this feels better for me now, but there were years where as devoted as I was to making songs and working on music, the inner critic was so loud and painful and would just, it was a slog and it was just constantly beating myself up. And it's something I've had to work on a lot, but just this, like you're talking about this human element and all the things that creating art can bring out about ourselves um, is really speaking to me. I'm sure a lot of people will really connect with that, that I, idea. I think it's really, I think it's really prevalent. And like my, my father was a musician his whole life. He was a brilliant like guitarist and and bass player. He was awesome. Um, but it hit a really difficult relationship with it because it like almost worked out the way he wanted it to and never quite got there. And I watched him wrestle with that, right? And like he'd pick up a guitar and he'd be having such a good time. And then you could see that sort of like filter in, right? That like ugh. you mean when he it didn't quite get where he wanted to? What are you referring to there if you don't mind sharing? Oh, no, absolutely. Um, so he played in a band. Um, he was in the era where like his band opened for sticks at one point. So like uh -huh. in that, right. Um, and he loved the band and he was, he was like super talented. Like I can hear him in my head right now, like playing in our basement when I was a kid. Right. Uh -huh. And they had, they were sort of about to like break, right. Like after they had opened for sticks and kind of done that whole thing and the stuff kind of fell apart interpersonally as it can happen sometimes, right. In any group. Hmm. Uh -huh. Um, and they were this close to kind of like music was going to be his whole life and he wouldn't have to kind of do the other things. Uh, right. Yeah. And I watched him kind of wrestle with that his whole life. And then, you know, I see when I work with clients, right. This sort of like desire to be creative and to really like make friends with that part of themselves, but all of these other pieces come in, can really get in the way. And it's, it's hard to watch for, for people to have something that feels so good, become so complicated. Um, and like, nobody talks about what to do with that. They're just like, oh, I don't know, make money. Well, okay, sure. 
Right. Okay. So I had cut you off um, when you were talking about what drew you to this particular topic and you were saying just this human side of art. Um, and was there, was there anything you wanted to add to that? I also just find jealousy kind of fascinating um, in the same way that I kind of find how our society kind of interacts with anxiety really fascinating. Like they're both totally normal human emotions. There's nothing inherently unhealthy about jealousy. There's nothing inherently unhealthy about like anxiety, but we kind of have this sort of societal like notion that those things should be eradicated. Like if you have jealousy, the goal is to like stamp it out, right? Ooh, is clapping like a bad thing for the sound? Is that a oh, no, no, that okay. was fine. Um, so like, it's this sort of like thing to like stamp out the jealousy, right? And if you're anxious, the goal is like to never be anxious again. And that's Mm -hmm. A, impossible, and B, really unhelpful for people to have the eradication of those kind of difficult emotions as the goal, like for health. It, it's not it's not helpful to have that kind of um, as like the, the goal point for people. So I think working with jealousy is fascinating um, because if, if we can like shift our relationship with it, it it's really liberating. Um, and I, I think that work is super cool. So when I saw the music and the jealousy, I was like, hoo, 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 hoo. yes, please. <laughs> Amazing. Well, you know, you said, um, you just said, if we could find a way to sort of work with it, um, the jealousy, what, what does that look like? Um, you know, I think it's, I think it's different for different people, but kind of like the, like the core, like little nugget piece of, of working with it and living with it is being able to kind of tolerate it. First is kind of the the first piece, right? Is being able to let it sit because we can't learn anything about it if we can't sit with it at all, right? And so kind of the first goal is to tolerate it, to like let it be able to like hang out with you, right? Um, just feel it. Yeah, just like just let it. Let it be. Yes, absolutely. Be. Okay. And then kind of the second part, like once we kind of take it from this like really threatening entity to this thing that shows up that we're like, ugh. No, right. Mm -hmm. We can start to kind of like talk to it and get understand it, find out like what it is that it wants us to know. Cause I, I think that that's such a big piece of like with the jealousy, like it's telling us something. And if we can tolerate it enough to try to figure out what that message is, there might be something really important there. And that's kind of the, the way that I try to work with people with jealousy, whether it's because I see like individuals and couples and families. Mm -hmm. And so when I work with jealousy, either with individuals or with couples or like with siblings, right. We try to learn like, what is the jealousy trying to tell you? Like, what aren't you getting that it's trying to get for you by like coming forward this way? This feeling um, is, is functional. It's trying to, it's a signal. Yes. yes, absolutely. There's, there's a message here that it's trying to give us. And if we can listen, it's probably important. So it's not, you shouldn't be feeling jealous. It's, hey, that's here. Let's let's see what this is about. For sure. Which is like easier said than done, right? But yeah. that's where we that's where we want to go. Um, you know, as much as we can when it shows up. here's some areas that I think people frequently feel jealous as a musician. So one might be someone else's performance ability. Yeah. Another might be feeling jealous of someone else's, what you perceive as their raw talent. Yeah. Another could be um, somebody's, I've had clients who have an idea that they should be working on music like, six hours a day, nonstop, totally in the state of flow. So feeling like, you know, are other people doing this? Why am I not able to, this is yeah. mean I'm not a real musician or, you know, why can't I work like that? Yeah. A biggie. And this pops up, people don't use the word jealous, but in this, um, um, podcast, I've done so many interviews with musicians and just about all of them talk about comparing themselves on social media. So yeah. jealous of the numbers of the likes of the play counts of somebody's showing their videos of their European tour, that kind of stuff, whatever. 
whatever's popping up on social media. And then I, the last one that I added here um, was just kind of jealous of somebody's career, you know, how they perceive them to be their status, I yeah. guess. Absolutely. Like someone who's like, quote unquote, like made it, made it that kind of yeah. thing. Yes. Absolutely. Those, I love those examples. I, my brain is like, Ooh. um, that's, I think those are so, I think that those are so interesting. I really, that like the raw talent one, like really got me. Cause that wasn't something that I had thought of, but that makes so much sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and that feeling like there's like a formula, like there's a right way to be a musician, like that one really, those two lit off my little, my little neurons. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, there's kind of an overarching piece that I kind of work with people with jealousy sometimes that I think would work here. And then we can kind of like take it into some specifics, but I think there's a couple pieces, right? There's that, like, what is the jealousy trying to tell us? And that definitely applies to these. And there's the other part where like the values work that we kind of um, talked about a little bit via email comes in of like embracing the, like the crappy feelings a little bit. And like, if I can't get all the way to this thing that I feel like I want or that I should want, how can I use my values to get like as close to it as possible in a way that's in alignment with me? Um, and so I think those are both like really applicable with these pieces. And so like that, that feeling like there's like a formula, that there's like a right way to be a musician. There's a right way to be like a, a quality musician or a musician who's like really pursuing it in the best way, in the most authentic way. Right. I think, you know, with the, the kind of the jealousy piece and looking at why it's showing up. I think when there's a formula for things, it gives us this really nice black and white, I'm doing it or I'm not doing it, right? Mm -hmm. And that black and white notion of success or rightness or correctness is really attractive. And I think it's really attractive, especially when you're working in a field like music, where there's really some like very nebulous definitions of success Mm -hmm. and what it means to be successful and what it means to be good even, right? Like, you ask, you know, 40 different people what a good musician is, you're going to get 40 different answers. Right. Right. And so I think if you kind of use that jealousy to look at why is this attractive? Am I looking for external markers of success? Because I've never developed any of my own. Maybe I need to go ahead and develop those internal markers for what success is for me. Is it a particular piece that I want to be able to play? Is it a length of playing time? Is it a, I want to be generating new music this often? Is it a, I want to move to being able to play only what I like to play and not have to play, you know, gigs where I'm like, I guess. Right. And so it really, it can really kind of tell you there like, okay, I don't have any internal markers. And so I'm really striving for these external markers I need to go ahead and develop those internal markers so that I get to define success. So we're talking about kind of a generalized jealousy, like, I'm seeing maybe this artist and I have feelings of jealousy. You know, maybe I see this person on social media and they've got this big show that they played and I, that's stirring up feelings of jealousy for me. Mm -hmm. And then I think you're saying, how do I turn within and see what, I don't know if you're saying this, but what aspects of that am I reacting to? So like what aspects of that am I reacting to? And also like specifically with like kind of that definition of like what it is to be a good musician. So if you're kind of like, it's sort of like a little like A to B to C, right? If you're seeing this person and you think they're successful and then you want to take their formula of like, I practice for six hours a day, five days a week. And on Sunday, I practice for 10 hours or Uh whatever, right? And you're like, okay, if I do this, then I'll be successful, right? We're jealous of the routine that we think got them to the success that we like. And we try to do the six hours every day and the 10 hours on Sunday. And our brain is just like not having it, right? We're not doing it. 
we find we're coming up with excuses and emergencies, whatever, right? And you're getting down on yourself because you're not doing it. Yeah. And then you get that that inner dialogue of like, well, this is why I haven't achieved this, right? Because I'm not my favorite. I'm not disciplined enough. Mm -mm. Yes. I'm not disciplined like, enough. Yes. I just, I, I would like to like, just scratch that from the dictionary. That word is who, um, right. So you have not disciplined enough. And so if I could do this, this routine, then I can have this, this picture, right. Of this life that looks really good. Maybe that routine doesn't apply to you because six straight hours of practice is going to absolutely melt your brain. It would melt my brain. Yeah. I would be a puddle on the floor of like goo that couldn't make a word. Right. So what the, we can kind of do with the values piece there, once we understand why the jealousy is there, right? Because we think if we can do this, we can be that. Mm -hmm. So we're jealous of that routine because we think that's the key to success, right? We can do the values piece there of like, okay, what is it about getting to this success place that I want? What is it about this routine that I really want? Is it that I want to play for six hours a day and 10 hours a day on Sunday? Or am I so attached to this because I think it unlocks this thing that's really important to me? And if that's kind of what it is, then we can go and look at making our own routine. Because if the best way we practice is two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, two hours in the evening, because our brain will melt, great. That makes me feel like I am improving in a way that feels good. Or maybe there's other pieces that you can add in there that once we can identify what's going to make you feel improved, we work towards that, not this like abstract thing you should be doing so that, you know, you get the, the big tour or whatever it is that we see that we really want and kind of back up there. Let's use another example. So, okay, just, just so I'm clarifying, we're focusing, you know, I, I kind of bullet pointed these different things we could be jealous of. And I think we're talking right now about perceiving someone's productivity. Yes. So maybe this will work. Maybe it won't. Maybe, maybe they got this great interview in the Chicago reader. Okay. So I want that. I want to, I want to be interviewed. I want to be featured in the, in the reader. So how do you, how would we apply kind of what you're saying here? to to that that would feel like a success to somebody yes so that would be like so kind of the first thing we want to do is is like get comfortable with the jealousy right of like okay it's there it makes sense right this person had this really cool thing happen it makes sense that you're looking at that and being like yeah i would like that too so we're gonna let that feeling sit because it's it's legitimate it's normal to want that right and we're going to get curious about what about that the jealousy wants. Is it that it wanted to talk to someone about their music, their music, who they think is like a, a person who thinks about music in a cool way, who interacts with music in a cool way, right? Is it like that person's perspective on music is cool and so I want to have a conversation with them? Is it if the article gets published in the Chicago Reader, then I'm going to get a social media bump and if I get a social media bump, I'm more likely to book this venue. Is it, um, you know, one of my friends has expressed a negative opinion about me being a musician uh, as like my trade. And so I would really, really like to like put this in someone's face, right? <laughs> what is it about this thing that feels really attractive? And it's probably multiple things, right? And so then once we identify it, and maybe we identify that, the thing is that they think the the Chicago Reader article is going to bump their social media presence or their plays, right? And that that's going to get them in front of someone who can really boost them, right? It's going to get them into a venue or in front of someone who is able to like kind of pop you up to another level of, of you know, being um, in front of people. Okay, so we really are wanting to like increase our visibility. That's what we're jealous of, right? Okay, so that's the thing that we want. How do we increase our visibility in a way that feels good to us? And that's the values piece of like, okay, so maybe that's, um, you know, work-life balance is a value, right? And so I want to increase it, but I'm only willing to do these couple extra things a week because I don't want to spend 10 hours on social media stuff, right? And so- because I don't have time to put towards that, I'm going to limit it, but I'm going to make 
like measurable impact on that every week. That's a way that we can move that way, right? Maybe it's um, you've been taking a break from playing for a while, like playing shows. Maybe it's okay. I need to do what I need to do to get back to where I can be playing shows and feel comfortable with that, right? Kind of identifying like what what you can do that actually feels good to you that will still pursue that goal so that you're moving in that direction, but you're doing it in a way that aligns with your values and that aligns with the energy you actually have to give rather than kind of looking at this one thing as the only access point to the thing that you are wanting. If we can broaden that. I love this conversation because it is, even though we're making up examples, it's so concrete. And I like that you are emphasizing, recognize the feeling. The the feeling is fine. It's telling you something and get specific about what it's telling you. Yeah. Very. Get very specific about. So yeah, I mean, we might say, yeah, an article in the reader, of course, you know, that's cool. But you're kind of saying, but why? Why is it cool? It's yes. cool. Mm-hmm. It's cool. Dig, dig, go further. Why is it cool? Yes. What does that mean to you? What is? What do you think that did for them that you would want? Get specific. Yes. Like, where is the nugget here of like this? Because we can pull out a nugget. The tighter we can get that nugget, the more ways we can find to access it, the more like actionable ways we can find to access it. And it's, and I I tell my clients when we do this work, I'm like, it's going to be annoying. You're going to be annoyed with me because I'm going to keep asking you like, why was it, what is it about that thing? And after like the third or fourth time I ask you that question, you're going to want to like close your computer. And that's fair, (laughs) but I promise there's a reason why I'm asking you this so many times because it, it feels like it's a nugget, but we, there's like 10 more steps usually to get down to the middle of that thing about why this matters so much to us. Yes. Okay. So seeing if you can go beyond what it, what it appears to be on the surface and kind of look at why, why is a ship? Why is a reader article important to you? What is, what would that give you? What does that mean? Um, and I can see even doing some journaling or writing might be for some people might be helpful to sort of make a list or think that through. Um, And then again, going back and saying, okay, I've identified that per your example, I feel like it will elevate my presence in terms of being able to access a bigger venue or social media presence or something like that. And so then you're saying, well, let's, let's, let's not make it about the reader article exactly. Mm Mm-hmm. But let's say, okay, we've actually arrived at the thing you're wanting, which is more a, bi- a, a bigger show, a bigger venue or something. And what concrete steps can you begin to take to work towards that? Yes, absolutely. And also like really defining like what that bigger venue means, right? And so we're not only defining the nugget of like why it matters, but like we're also really tightly defining what the thing is that we're trying to achieve. Because like bigger venue is like super like, boy, has that got some fuzzy edges. Yes. Right. And you could sort of drive yourself bonkers sort of going towards like bigger venue when like there's like very little definition there, right? And so like, is it more people? Is it they've got better sound equipment? And so my music is going to sound way better because their sound is is just higher quality than wherever. So you're not just saying pick the venue that you want, but you're saying, why do you want that venue? Yes. And then I'm going to ask you 10 more times about this and you're going to want to close the computer again. (laughs) Okay. So I want, um, Talia Hall because if you play Talia Hall, it means you have hit a certain level in the scene. It's a big venue. It draws a lot of people can come to it more than they can come to the empty bottle. So pick at that. Then what would you pick at? So then if we were picking at, so it's more people can come there than the empty bottle. And there's like more visibility in terms of people who have like some kind of power 
right on kind of the scene and remind me the first one was well the first one is kind of just a status you know everyone's going to see that you play talia hall They're okay like, so wow you play talia hall yes uh-huh absolutely okay so kind of my first because the the part about like you can get more people in the door of an empty bottle right like that's that's pretty concrete and so my question there would be like is there a number that we're going for that we've kind of formed as like this would be the thing right are we going for a certain number of people like why is the more what we're going for so I can understand what it is about the more that's attractive Mm -hmm. because for some people what ends up happening is that like we get to well this one time in seventh grade I was reading this magazine and this artist said that if you can play to this many people you've made it and then we can look at that and be like okay is that our value or is that theirs? And like, do we, can we shift there? Like, is this something that really is meaningful to us or did someone tell us that this matters? Okay, okay. So that we kind of look at there. In terms of like the, sort of like the name, like the um, like the cachet that comes with playing at, at a particular place, right? Mm-hmm. I'd want to understand why that's so important, right? Because obviously like we all want to be successful in the thing that's important to us, Right. But if we can kind of pull at why, why we're wanting to kind of like hit these names, is it because that's something that for me is how I measure my success? Is that something that my, you know, parents, I can tell them and they'll understand what Talia Hall is, right? Mm -hmm. Is that something where the, um, the money that I would get from playing at venues that size would allow me to quit the job that I absolutely flip and hate Mm -hmm. and do music full time. Like what is the cash, like what is the cachet getting us? That's really important to us. Is it full-time music? Is it there's someone that I've been wanting to impress since I was five years old who will finally be impressed with me? Is it, um, you know, I just really want to look cool, which is a totally legitimate goal. Like, Uh yes, we would all like to look super cool. Right. Uh And so kind of picking at that. So we understand what it is about the cachet that's important, because if we can't access Talia Hall right now, maybe we can access something that bumps our feeling of like being a cool kid a little bit in a different way while we work towards this bigger goal so that we still feel like we're accomplishing our goals even if we can't get to like the ultimate piece, we can still get stuff in that feels good to the part of us that wants that thing so that we keep that fulfillment. Gotcha. And so then you're helping people figure out again, pretty concretely, what might that look like? If you're wanting to just feel, I mean, I I think it would be funny to talk about uh, what would help someone to feel cooler, but whatever that might be, (laughs) what could you Mm-hmm. <laughs> we all have different definitions of like what would make us a cool kid, right? Yeah. Talk about having to define some things. We'll have to define what cool means to you. That um, is a big question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big question. Yeah. So, but yeah. Um, okay. So we're really breaking it down. We're really using the feeling and really getting to what's underneath all of this. Yeah. I think with things like this, you know, concreteness is is really important because if, if the thing that you're like talking about or the thing that you're working with yourself about, right? Like if you're not going to go see a therapist about this, but you're going to try to do some internal work and and figure it out for yourself, right? Exploring is beneficial, right? But there's a point at which like understanding doesn't translate to higher satisfaction or more fulfillment or, a change that feels meaningful. And so when I do this kind of work with people, my goal is to get really concrete stuff because sometimes we're talking about things that we can't change, right? Like you can't make someone book you at Talia Hall, right? You can't go in there and be like, book me, book me, right? You could try, probably isn't going to work out super good, right? So you can't force the issue. And when I do this work and other things with people, like a lot of this is around people's jobs, right? But when we do this work, maybe it's not possible for you to make someone book you at Talia Hall, or maybe you can't quit this job because you need the money that it's bringing in. How do we get the most satisfaction out of the place that you're in if we can't immediately shift it? How do we make this place feel more fulfilling? How do we draw the joy out of it? How do we put boundaries in there that are going to help it feel better? Because if we can't shift it, we want it to feel better. Do you, is there some way we can make an example of what you're talking about there? First, in terms of like music pieces? I think it'd be good to keep it. Yeah. yeah with music. Absolutely. Yeah. So 
I'm thinking like someone else's performance ability, that kind of example that you gave, right? Um, so there's no way you can snap your fingers and become like, pick your really amazing, incredible, like gift from the universe talent musician, right? Yeah. Most of us could like, I could play guitar every day for the rest of my life. Not to be very good. I've tried, right? So we have like a threshold in some cases, right? And so if the thing that we really want is to be as good as this person, if we have jealousy there, right? You can't snap your fingers and become like Tom Morello, right? It's not, not going to happen. And so if you still want to pursue your art, which I think is good for everybody to pursue your art, people do better when they're pursuing their art and their music and their creativity. If we want to stay pursuing those things and still get fulfillment out of it so that yes, we're driving towards the goal, but we're still feeling fulfilled and connected with ourselves in the process, then we need to understand how we can still feel like we're achieving on the way to this thing that we may or may not get to. So we form different goals. We form different measures. We work at driving and understanding why this is important. Like, what does it get you that feels like it would solve everything? Because that's usually the feeling, right? If I could just blank, my life would be great. Why? How? Like, how is the question there, right? How would your life be great? Mm -hmm. And how can we pull in as many bits and pieces of that as possible? And sometimes they're really tiny bits and pieces. But if we can kind of get a cumulative thing going, it tends to feel much better for people. And their pursuit tends to feel much more worthwhile. So let's say they they have a full-time job mm -hmm. and they want to get really, really good at the guitar. And mm -hmm. they've got a full-time job and they can only devote so much time a day. I would yeah. imagine that there would be a tension there between, well, a, re a resentment maybe, you know, my day job prevents me, my family prevents me, just these obligations, capitalism, whatever it is that people yeah. are feeling. How, how would you help them to resolve that tension, that reality that, well, you do have to go to work and yes. you only have that much time every day. How do you, how would you work with them on that? So one of the things that I think would be really important there is how do we like enshrine that time that you do have as fully as possible so that there is nothing getting into that time that is pulling you out of it, right? Like what do we put in place? So if you have, you know, you've got the job and let's say you've got, you know, like people obligations, right? You have like people or animals who need you outside of the job, like whatever that structure looks like, right? So maybe that is that instead of like when you come home, the laptop goes away, the phone goes away, we're not doing those things because this is music time. Mm -hmm. All of that stuff goes away. It does not have access to you for the time that you are engaging in this music part. Um, you know, and for some people, you know, that is really, really difficult. And so we work on scaling it back slowly. Right. So I can maybe, see that people would, I mean, already I'm thinking like, well, someone might be, well, that's not going to be enough. And I already feel discouraged. And, you know, I can yes. see those feelings coming up. Yes. And so that like, we do a lot of like, it's it, like, it counts work as well, because like I, I myself, I'm a person who I'm like, it's a hundred percent or it's nothing. Uh -huh. And so I'm very familiar with that feeling of like, so what if I can go for a 10 minute walk, right? Like it doesn't count. Uh -huh. So we do a lot of work around those pieces of, yes, maybe one 10 minute walk is, it does not feel like it counts. But if in a month you've done a 10 minute walk every day, that's going to have a cumulative effect. Mm -hmm. Is it fixing it? No. Are you going to have, you know, maybe a 5% feeling of living more closely to what you would like to be doing? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that counts. That counts because we can keep building on that and we're still closer to where we want to be. And we can grieve the fact that we can't get all the way to the thing. That sucks. And there's no but buts about it. It sucks. Yeah. But it's worth trying to make incremental progress. Just even if it's just to live closer to how you'd like to live, there's worth there. And it tends, it almost always builds on itself, right? And so- 
there's definitely pushback when I talk about this with people around like work stuff, right? And so maybe it's okay, we're putting the phone away, but if the email goes off, we can check uh-huh. it this week. Next week, we're not going to. We're going to like back off slowly because it's super anxiety producing for people. Uh-huh. Under- it's like bosses, uh, right? So we kind of do that slowly and in increments, kind of blocking it off that way. If your kids are at home and they understandably want access to you, maybe they go to a friend's house for an hour after school so that you get to play. Maybe your spouse takes them to the park for an hour so that you get to play. Maybe you, you know, do the horrible thing we're never supposed to do and bribe them a little bit, right? But you get to play, right? Maybe if your dog tends to bug the crap out of you, you know, while you're playing, you take them to doggy daycare for a couple hours, whatever it is. Like if we can put blocks in, so that time is fully that time, that time gets a lot more meaningful because you're not pulled between six and seven different things. Right. That is your time with your passion uninterrupted. So how do you respond? Because I can hear, I can hear this coming back because I've heard it from clients. Yeah. How do you respond to the, and, and this goes to the values piece, I think, where it's like, I do value that enshrining that hour a day to practice guitar, but then I feel guilty because I'm not spending time with kids or I just don't have the energy or I just don't have, what do you do when it feels like essentially what they're saying is there's not enough hours in the day? Yeah. So there's a couple pieces there. So if we're talking about guilt, we start talking about where you learned that guilt because chances are we learned it from somewhere icky, right? Like some of that guilt, like a lot of that like parent guilt, right? Of like, if you're not spending 24 hours a day devoted to your child, you're somehow deficient. Mm-hmm. That creates a super unhealthy parent. Not great for anybody, right? Right. Um, and so we talk about like where that guilt is coming from. If the guilt is I should be working more hours because I should be making more money. Where did we learn that? Is that something we actually value or is that something we were told we should value? Mm, Okay. There's a lot of work in why we value this thing. Okay. As as we go through life, right? Even from like we're teeny, teeny, tiny, we're told what matters and what doesn't over and over and over and Mm -hmm. ad nauseum, right? We're told these things so often and we're told so many of them covertly that they feel like they're intrinsic values. Mm Mm-hmm. They feel like they've come from us. A lot of them haven't. And so there's real value in pulling apart. Is this your value or were you taught this? And do we want to keep it? A lot of the times it's like, ooh, no, I don't want to keep that thing. Mm -hmm. That thing isn't serving me. That thing doesn't really resonate with me. Um, I don't want to keep that thing, right? And so there's, we do work there when we're when we have these blocks we look at them from like why does this feel like a block why do you feel like you shouldn't be exchanging this for this right like all those pieces okay if it's a question of energy i kind of first of all we talk about where is your energy getting expended Mm -hmm. and is there somewhere reasonable that we can cut it to devote it to this right if you're spending four hours manicuring your lawn every weekend and you really don't give a flying hoot about your lawn Mm -hmm. Let's cut that and put that over here where you actually care about it, where it's actually good for you. Let your neighbors go kick it. Like we're going to just switch this, right? Because you're going to have to make some choices because in the pie chart of the day, there are only so many pieces and you got to make some choices. So you are kind of figuring out what do you value? Do you value this music time? Or if you find, you know, and why do you value it? Mm -hmm. Exploring all that. Yes. Absolutely. And it's, it's like digging into all those things because so often like this really tight fence around us, there's places we can knock part of that down that are going to feel better, that we're going to, it's going to open up space for stuff that actually matters to us. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we do a lot of work in there because you're right. There is a pie chart of the day. And as much as I would love to like boop an extra four hours onto all of my clients, Mm -hmm. I haven't figured out how to do that yet. Right. So we have to deal with like the 24 hours that we do have and, 
and figure out how we pull as much meaning for ourselves out of those 24 hours as we can. And so sometimes your lawn looks like shit. Ooh, sorry. You go ahead. Okay. I said, these are musicians. They don't care. They're, oh, they're like sailors. These wonderful. Musicians. Okay. okay. I have like um, 10 years as a bartender mouth. So I'm surprised <laughs> oh, yeah. long without cursing like a blue streak. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's real strong. Um, so yeah, like that's kind of what we, you know, we work with there. And then sometimes, you know, that's when like the couples work starts of like, let's get some buy-in from your partner on this. And like, how do we help them understand why this is so important? Mm-hmm. Um, and that room needs to be made. Yes. Um, okay. Let's, because this is the number one thing that comes up mm-hmm. and it comes up so often. I, I'd love to talk a little bit about the feelings that musicians have on social media, which is almost always feels like this necessary evil. Got to promote my shows. This is how I find out about my friend's shows. You know, I like yeah. that part um, or just keep up with people. But I also see the like counts. I see followers. I see people playing this amazing stage with a full, you know, crowd in there or they're whatever. And so it's, it's this really difficult relationship and they're, you know, musicians are forever going on and off and, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot to be said about social media. I guess I'm wondering, it it evokes these feelings of comparison and jealousy though. So I, I guess I'm wondering specifically when it comes to those feelings how would you begin working with somebody on that kind of comparative messiness that comes up for musicians on social media? A hundred percent. Like I, when you talk about like that, from that, like likes and play count, that is such a concrete thing. Mm-hmm. That is, I'm just thinking of like, that's gotta be so difficult for people to sit with of like, it's just this black and white figure sitting in front of your face, Right. It's, there's no clear comparison than numbers. Oh man, so brutal. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So brutal. Yeah. I can see why that would be super distressing. So I think there's a couple pieces. I think, you know, there's, and this is a shock to nobody, right? Kind of all of our relationship with social media is usually not great. Right. Yeah. And so the kind of the first thing I do is like a very like fundamental, okay, like what is our social media use actually looking like to, to get an idea of like how much time we're spending, what the time looks like, you know, what that is, because if it's a part of your business, eradicating it is an unrealistic goal, right? Like we can't just bop off of social media and expect people to like wander by the venue on the right day. Like right. it's a, like you said, a necessary evil, right? And so kind of a little kind of beginning piece might be, okay, if you're spending X amount of time on social media and you've got, you know, A amount of time that's personal personal social media use and B amount of time that's business social media use, let's see if we can like knock it off with the personal or reduce that for a while to, to like reduce our overall exposure so that we're not using our tolerance on both these things. Hmm. Let's mm-hmm. use our tolerance on the business part that we cannot eradicate because we need it to get mm-hmm. people to our shows. Right. So that would be like a little like concrete fundamental thing right in the beginning from there. I'd want to know what it is about the social media stuff. That's really getting to you. Is it the show videos where you can see like a full pit? Is it the play count on whatever hosting platform you're playing your music on? Is it um, you know, what, is it that's really hitting for you, right? Because I think there's different, we might have a slightly different like meaning or or value behind it depending on what the thing is, right? Yes. So if it's, I see all these people with full shows and it's a freaking bummer to play shows like where I can see seats or I can see space. And it really like highlights to me this thing that bums me out every time I see it at my show. Mm -hmm. That's like one matter, right? Because that's like, okay, how do we deal with some of that disappointment? How do we deal with those difficult feelings that come with that? How do you reaffirm your worth, right? When like you're in that stage of like playing, like maybe not so full rooms, right? Mm -hmm. If it's the light counts, it's like, okay, why is the, the count, you know, so important? We might kind of look at a little bit of like the math stuff of like, okay, if we're looking at are we, are we comparing apples to oranges or are we comparing apples to like, you know, skyscrapers? What do you mean there? 
like, are you looking, when you were looking at comparing counts, Mm -hmm. are you comparing counts with people who are in similar positions with you? Mm -hmm. Are you comparing counts to people who are operating very differently from you and might be at a different stage? I think that, I do think that most people would feel, would answer that in, Mm -hmm. I'm looking at people that I feel are peers. That you feel like, okay. So if we're looking that, if we're looking at people who you feel are peers and we're comparing play counts there, that would kind of be a place that we'd start looking into like what goes into those play counts, right? Like maybe someone's mom is like putting their album on Spotify every night, <laughs> playing it over and over and over and over again. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I had friends, you know, who, who had, you know, released an album, like this was, I think, oh God, this was the before times, this was before COVID. And we all would, every night we would put their album on Spotify and it would over and over, right? Yeah. There, so there was a whole, you know, group of people who were, who were doing this every night. And so like, are you, are, maybe there's some of this piece going on, right? We're kind of trying to poke holes in the, I'm comparing to a peer because we don't know exactly how they're getting that count. It Maybe. reminds me of in elementary school when you would sell the chocolate bars and some kids' parents would take them to work and they would like yes. sell so many of them. My parents would never do that yes, because uh, they didn't want to push chocolate bars on their coworkers. That's exactly uh, what it was, right? And this kid yeah. would walk in with like, you know, literal thousands of dollars of sales. Right. He'd be like, I got 10 doors slammed in my face walking <laughs> on the block, dude. Like yes. what? Uh, yeah. Okay. It, it's the same thing, right? Yeah. Because that is, you might have someone whose parent is doing the equivalent mm-hmm. of taking their, you know, their sign up sheet, you know, to work. Like, you know, I, I was a kid, my dad took his stuff to his <laughs> office and like, he would, you know, I'm sure there were some, some iffy power dynamics there. Cause he was like a sales manager. <laughs> that was the most ethical thing. <laughs> But, you know, like that I was, that was, and if, if I was a person who was a musician, I uh, bet your ass, my dad would be doing, you know, and he'd be doing the right. same. Thing. So it would be an, a, a bad comparison, right? Because you I, don't know what people, what's going on behind the scenes. You don't know. Maybe somebody's publicist, you know, is, is boosting their, like, you don't know what's totally. happening behind the scenes. Right. And so really what we're trying to do is poke holes in this idea that feels very black and white. Yeah and shift it into the gray. Um, Cause especially when we're dealing with difficult feelings like jealousy, we get real black and white real quick cause we're uncomfortable. Mm. And we try to push back into the gray as much as possible. That's interesting. Why do you, why is that? Why, when we have this uncomfortable feeling, we'll go to the black and white. Black and white feels really safe. Black and white is absolutes. Black yeah. and white is quantifiable. Black and white is if A, then B, if I do this, then I get this, no ifs, ands, or buts. Mm. It's super comforting because you're like, that. What that's what gets that feeling of, well, if I could just boop, then boop, right? Yeah. That's super black and white. And so when we get scared, we go black and white. It's easier in the black yeah. and white. Simplifies, yes. Absolutely. And especially if you're feeling under threat in some way, your brain is not wanting to like expend energy in the gray, Right it's going straight to black and white because Uh it thinks there's a threat. And it's like, we don't have time, my guy, like make decisions, right? So black and white is really attractive when we're stressed. So would you say to this example, it could be helpful to learn how that person is? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, people protect that. They don't tend to talk a lot about what they're doing behind the scenes. So that is a piece. But I think when you do learn, it's almost always like, Oh, their mom. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, now I get it. Okay. Yeah. And like 10 pieces fall into place. Right. Yeah. And mm-hmm. like, cause then so often after that comes this feeling of why was I so upset? Yeah. Or like, oh, that makes so much sense. Right. It makes sense. Yes. Yeah, like, oh yeah. Like their, their third cousin is this guy who like, right. There's usually, there's usually something there. Yeah. Cause like, you know, and not to get too far into the whole like stress response thing, but like when, when we get activated, like fight, flight, freeze, fawn, right. Our brain narrows options. It doesn't want you to see the full field because it takes too much time to make the decision. Right. Mm-hmm. And then like, you know, way back when, when that system developed, like, you know, the tiger had eaten you by mm-hmm. the time you made your decision out of 20 decisions. Right. So we get stressed and our brain's like, here, you can have two. Yeah. 
And so we see these two things. When we open that back up by being in the gray, that's when we get the, oh, that makes sense. Because it was in the other 18 things our brain right. narrowed out because yes. it got stressed. Okay. So, so understanding there's things going on that you don't know about. Mm -hmm. There's things that you don't think there's things going on that you don't know about. And then there's also, you know, I think particularly in things like music, like creative pursuits, you know, there's this really uncomfortable piece of it. That is, there are some parts of this, often many parts of it that are outside of individual control. Yeah. Right. And so that is a really crappy notion to butt up against when this thing that you want is like this intrinsic part of your soul. Like if mm -hmm. you are a deeply creative person, that is your core, right? Like that is your being, right? Yeah. And so to bump up against my access to having more of this in my life has outside influence that I can't control. That's a deeply distressing thought. Yeah. Yeah. Like that is like core level, like scary stuff, right? Un unfair. Yeah. Might extremely. not feel fair. Yeah. Yeah. Unfair um, bullshit. You know, uh -huh. it's, it sucks. And it's often the lack of control often comes because the control is in the hands of people who like don't necessarily give a shit about your art. Right. And that's yeah. like triple infuriating. Mm -hmm. Right. And so sometimes we have to do a lot of work when some of those feelings are around forces that we can't control. We have to do a lot of work around how do we gain a little bit of acceptance there? Not acceptance of like, oh, well, right? But acceptance of this is a reality. And so I'm still going to pursue this because this is meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. How am I going to relate to the fact that there is a part of this that is outside of my control? Yeah. How am I going to relate to that in a way that feels okay and livable to me? And that's usually values-based. It's going to be different for everybody. And this is something that I work with on people who work in large systems too, like healthcare, education, that kind of stuff, where you're kind mm -hmm. of part of a big machine. Yeah. The machine does not care about your personal stuff, right? And so there's a lot of work when I work with people in those professions as well um, of like, okay, this is, we don't have control here. And if we're going to continue to operate in the system, because just like music, like education or healthcare is often a calling for people, uh -huh. we're going to stick in the system because it's what's important to us. How do we make peace with the fact that there is a line here where our influence is likely to end? Mm. And that's values-based work for sure. How to live with that in a way that you can um, have it occupy as little space in your brain as possible. I don't know if there, I mean, I'm sure this is a very big individualized answer, but how, how would one do that for, you know, play counts or how, how would you, what values would you look at there to reconcile that? So we might be looking at like, so with the play counts, if we're acknowledging that there's a piece of this that's outside of our control, like exposure or publicists or, you know, Brad's mom, whatever, right. <laughs> uh -huh. um, there's a, there's a mourning period for that. And this is something that comes in with any kind of values work when I'm working with someone around this and there's a piece that we can't control. We have to like honor that pissed off, sad part of us mm -hmm. that wants to rail against the thing outside of our control. Mm -hmm. Cuz it sucks. It shouldn't be there. It's really infuriating. It is saddening and maddening. And so there's mourning that has to be done there if I cannot shift that thing. Because if we don't acknowledge the mourning, that railing is never going to stop. Because the mourning is acknowledging that we can't change it, right? And so if there's this part of us that's always like, but I could, it's going to make living with it really, really difficult. So the mourning has to happen first, right? The kind of acceptance and mourning of it. After that... Then we start looking at, okay, if we know that this is out of our control and we still want to access this thing, we want higher play count, we want whatever, right? If we look at our own values, so maybe that's, um, so maybe this person is deeply opposed to asking people to play their album, right? Okay, why are we opposed to that? What's going on there? And we shift that. Can we get okay with asking for help? 
right? And like contact some people and be like, hey, my play count goal for this quarter is this. Can you help me out here, right? Maybe asking help is a way to access that. Maybe we have been afraid to, um, and I might sort of like show my my like very tiny knowledge of the industry part of music here. So, but like if we, maybe we don't apply to play at certain venues because we think we're likely to be rejected or we don't audition. That's the word for music, audition. Um, maybe we don't audition, right, at this venue because we think we're going to be rejected and there's no way they'd ever want us and all of those things, right? Why? What makes us so certain? Maybe we can go audition there. Maybe there's a medium venue between where we play now and where we'd like to play that we've been avoiding bridging because we're worried about getting rejected and we can go apply to that medium venue or audition at that medium venue and kind of take you know a half step there moving towards this thing. Like, how do we get pieces of what we're looking for? What parts of us are blocking that? And how do we use our value to like unblock? This is now I'm now I'm just, you know, I really I've really liked this conversation because um because of how concrete it is, you know, I, I'm almost wondering if there's, and I don't know if you know this, but if there's worksheets or, I mean, certainly, uh, working with a therapist who works with this kind of stuff and can help guide somebody such as yourself could be helpful. Absolutely. Um, there are like, so there are some, some ways you can access this. Like if you want to go on Google and kind of try to sort out kind of like what's valuable to me. There are definitely like worksheets and assessments that you can do. So you would look up like a values inventory. Um, you would look up values assessment. Um, the, the, the worksheets, there's some worksheets on like therapeutic websites as well. Like therapistaid.com actually has a couple values activities. Um, and you don't need to have a paid account to access the non-interactive one that's like just a sheet. Mm-hmm. So you can access those things there. Um, and there's tons and tons and tons of assessments. You can also kind of create an assessment for yourself, like just by starting to ask some questions, right? So if there's something that you're finding particularly distressing or that you'd like to shift, you can start asking yourself like, what specifically is it about this thing that bugs me? Yeah. Like what, what part of it is the thing that when that hits me, I'm like, oh God, no. Right. What is it about this thing that bugs me? Right. Why does it bother me that what part of me is it offending essentially is what we're looking for. Right. Because if this thing bugs us and this piece of this thing bugs us, it's because it's offending something about what we believe or who we are or whatever. Right. And if we so, can, so I don't have as many play counts as I'd like to have offends me because yeah, offends me because I think having a high play count is necessary to move to the next part of my career, right? Or I think my music is worthy of a lot of listens. Absolutely. Uh, yes. Okay. It offends so, me because my music is fucking awesome. My music is better. <laughs> yeah. say like there's a jealousy, right? So I, yes. yeah, kind of come back full, but Okay. So yeah, just digging. Yeah. Digging. Dig, asking yourself, why, why does this bother me? What is it offending? If we can figure out what it's offending, it's going to tell our, us our value, right? Because if your play count is offending you because your music is amazing, it's offending your self-worth. Hmm. It's offending your, your belief that you are worthwhile as a musician, right? And so that's the value that needs to be worked with. Your self-worth is the value that needs to guide how you're moving out of this because it's offending your self-worth, right? If your play count is bugging you because you have a band and your buddy's got a band and your buddy's got a bunch of plays and you don't, and you think your friends are listening to their album more than yours, right? That's offending the part of you that is connected to other people, right? That's offending you in terms of like, I felt these people were close to me, right? I was counting on them to help with this and they didn't. That's offending the part of you that's in relationship with those people. And so that's the part of you that needs to be addressed and how you're moving forward. Your value that you are deserving of support, right? 
that's the part that needs to be addressed. And then you can start working on how to, how to work towards that support or what you can shift to Absolutely. address that. Yeah. This has been great. I've super enjoyed this. Like I've had so much fun talking about this with you. <laughs> oh man. Uh, I have too. I, I love this. I, I really think, I, I hope, and I think that people will find this useful. I think it is so common. Yeah. To have these feelings. hundred percent. And I love that even though the feelings can be common, there's a wide assortment of what might be behind them. And Absolutely. what is it about for you? Absolutely. It's deeply individualized. Yeah. Deeply individualized because these things mean different things to different people for different reasons. Right. And it's super, super individualized. And I think the most important part of getting to living like in closer alignment with your values is to start questioning. Like, why, why is this important? What do I want out of it? Because once you start asking those questions, we're not taught to ask those questions. We're taught to recognize this as important and pursue it. Uh huh. Like, yes. That's what we're taught, right? We're not taught to question these things. And so we're really usually really unfamiliar why something's important to us. And it's really important to get to know why, because then you can get closer to more of the important part, which is huge for quality of life, huge. And so like my, I think my like biggest, you know, piece of this is start questioning why you're attaching to things the way you are not from like a why who don't, but from like a, what is it about? Yeah. That? Yeah. Start questioning those things. Cause very often we're told to abandon our own values about things in favor of kind of what we're supposed to be doing. And that can really start feeling crappy. Um, so I think just questioning and, and trying to understand why you value something the way that you do is super, super important. Cause then you get choice in that value. You get age, you get choice and you can create a plan. Yes. And you can take that. Cause I think, you know, sometimes in therapy, we get stuck in like the, the digging land and we don't get to like the, here's how this feels better land. Yeah. And it's a really short trip with values work from digging to here's how we make it feel better, which is why I like it so much um, and find such value in it because you can really shift people into things that feel better um, pretty concretely. And I, I like it because you're not necessarily, you you have less of a sense of just flopping around. Like I'm trying all these different things and I don't know why, and I'm hoping it'll all get me, but I think you'll feel more intentional about what you're doing and why. A hundred percent, right? You're not just like digging around, hopefully eventually the thing that needs to click. Yes. Right? Yes. And you're you're getting, there's a lot of hope in this kind of work. Yeah. I think. Um, oh yeah. A lot of hope in it, which is why I really, another reason that I really like it. Cause like sometimes life is just really rough and there's no, you, you can't unrough it. Yeah. And so if we can pull a little more out of life that feels good, like why not? Why not? Well, Rachel, thank you so, so much for your time and your thoughts today. Thank you for having me. I super enjoyed this. Okay. I want to thank Rachel for her time today. I hope that was helpful. Um, there's a lot to dig into there. I'm going to make a transcript and put it on the website. Visit musictherapypodcast.com. Previous episodes, upcoming events, all on the website. Stop by the Patreon. If you're feeling, uh, if you're feeling, uh, you know, you got some coins dangling in your pocket you want to you want to toss a couple into our uh, our water fountain uh we appreciate it music therapy is hosted by jessica risker produced by sullivan davis of local universe and engineered by joshua wentz in chicago peace and love until i see you again